need to <laughs> oh this is so fun this is so fun we got a special special guest today and um we're so lucky and we're so blessed and so inspired um, people like young Jean lee they inspire me just by being like in the proximity vicinity so this is this is a pretty good day i'm going to give you a little of her bio and then we're going to do our regular watch we work stuff and young Jean lee is going to join in um, so, Young Jin Lee is a Korean American playwright, director, and filmmaker. She was the artistic director of Young Jin Lee's Theater Company, a not for profit theater company directed to um, dedicated to producing her work. She has written and directed 10 shows for Young Jin Lee's Theater Company and toured her work in over 30 cities around the world. And um, Lee was called, quote, the most adventurous downtown playwright of her generation by Charles Isherwood in the New York Times, and quote, one of the best experimental playwrights in America by David Coate of Time Out New York. So she's got, she's got the people behind her. Um, with the two, 2018 production of Straight White Men at the Hayes Theater, Lee became the first Asian American woman to have a play produced on Broadway. It was an awesome production. And every time I see her work, I just get all happy. So we're so happy that you're here. And uh, you're going to join us for Watch Me Work, which is, uh, which is going to be fun. What we're going to do like we did yesterday with Oscar, everybody, what we're going to do, I'm sorry, I'm waving. It's, no one can tell. These, these cameras are so weird. What we're going to do is we're going to work together for 20 minutes. And then we're going to talk to, with Young Jean Lee about her work specifically. And then we're going to open it up and she will take your questions about your work and your creative process. Okay. And if there are any questions about that, Audrey's going to tell us how to get in touch. Yeah. Hi, everybody. Um, so as a reminder, if you want to ask a question and you are inside of the Zoom, all you need to do is click on the raise your hand button uh, in the participant tab, likely at the bottom of your screen on a laptop or the top if you're on an iPad or a tablet. And if you're watching on HowlRound.tv, um, all you can do is uh, tweet at us at, at WatchMeWorkSLP with the hashtag HowlRound, H-O-W-L-R-O-U-N-D. Uh, or you can tweet at us at, at PublicTheaterNY or send a message to our Instagram. That's all. That's all. That's all you need to do. And the first part is where we create some of the action of this together. And we work together for 20 minutes. I'll set the timer. Audrey will back me up. And here we go. Uh.
All right, here we are. Oops. All right, all right, all right. So um, now we are going to talk a little bit to Young Jean Lee about her work and her creative process. I got some questions I want to ask her because things I've always wondered about. <laughs> um, but no, specifically, if it's cool to talk sister about what you're doing what you're working on right now you feel like sharing a little bit we'd love to know uh sure um uh, some of the stuff i can't talk about but um uh well the thing that i was just working on now um during our work session was um i'm working on a musical it's my first like actual musical musical and it's um it's a comedy it's a it's a satire of the left and it's just, it's, it's, it's kind of kicking my butt. Like the few people who have seen it so far are, are like, oh my God, you can't, you can't do this. Um, <laughs> so I'm just trying to figure out a way that I can do it and still have a career after, you know, after I put it out. So it's, you know, it's just a really tricky thing right now, um, you know, because the right is just so powerful. Um, right now and um uh you know <laughs> the right you know it's it, it, it's such a problem that to um you know satirize or make fun of or critique the left feels a little bit um potentially counterproductive or not a good idea but at the same time i feel like part of the reason why the right is so powerful right now is because of the things that the left um, is doing. So it's, you know, I don't know, it's very, very, uh, it's very complicated and I'm, you know, scared, uh, you know, I, I, I was scared to even work on it, you know, in, in this session, like somehow, um, it, 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 it just, it, 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 it's a project that really scares me. And so that's, that's pretty typical for me, but just right now is a volatile time. So, um, I'm, I'm both excited and, um, yeah, just legit terrified. That's thrilling. You're, but you're right. You do, you always go to those places that scare you as, yeah. as an artist, you, you'd never sit in, you know, in your comfort zone. Um, so, and that's one of the reasons why we love you. So best of luck with that. I'm not going to ask you any more about, I mean, I want to ask you one little thing about it in, in a sec, but um, are you going to direct it? Are you planning to direct it? Because you direct most all your own work, right? Are you going to direct this yeah, one? Yeah, I mean, I've, I've, I've been experimenting the past few years with not directing my work, oh, but I really okay. miss it a lot. Huh. So I think um, coming up, I'm going to be, um, I'm going to be directing uh -huh, again. Uh -huh. Does that so, change uh, the way you're writing it? I mean, what, what's your experience? What do you think? Does it? Well, I've only done revivals with a director so far. Like mm -hmm. I have, I've never worked with a director on a new mm -hmm. play. I can't imagine doing that because I do the writing and the directing at the same time. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. So um, yeah, I just, you know, I, I just love to direct. And, and for me, it's hard to be a part of the process and to mm -hmm. have something going on that I love doing that I'm not the one doing. So that's, um, mm -hmm. that's, been, a, that's been a challenge. So mm -hmm. it's, um, mm -hmm. uh, I think, um, I'm going to go back to, you know, trying to direct for a while. Yeah. Yeah. But it, it's cool that, you know, you do, yeah, you do the world premiere and then you share the experience of directing experience with the, an, another director, which is pretty, which is pretty cool. Yeah. It's pretty cool. Um, well, you so, say, and you also produce, you do, you, you do it all. You also produce your own work. Um, how I, I what I want to know, did you produce straight white men on Broadway or was it a collaborative, uh, no, I actually, the last thing that I produced mm -hmm. with my company was Straight White Men at the Public. Oh, um, nice. Which I saw, which I liked. And then, uh, and then after, um, and then after that, I actually shut down my company okay. um, because uh, the, the um, you know, the, the thing about having a company is that you, you can't ever take a break from it because, you know, you're running a business. Um, so, you know, when you run a business, you can't just say, oh, I'm going to go do something else. So we're just going to shut down this business, um, for a year or so, and then come back to it. It doesn't work that way. You have to keep, keep funding it and keep the machine going. And so I, you know, I felt, I started to feel a little bit too, um, I started feeling a little bit trapped, 
um, like I couldn't go and try other things because I just had to had to keep this um, theater company going. And so I closed that down so that I could try other things. And um, it's been interesting because, uh, you know, it's like I was trapped in some ways, but I was also incredibly free um, in many ways. So it's been interesting that trade off of having this freedom where I can, you know, do whatever I want, go wherever I want. Um, but at the same time, I don't have that pro the, the power to just snap my fingers and like now this is happening. So um, it changes the collaborative. Does it change the collaborative nature? I mean, you, yeah, you have the freedom of your theater company. Um, but when you work with, say, Broadway producers or any producers or another director, it, does it change the nature of what you get to create when you're working with another producer or a producer other than yourself? Um, I, you know, I don't, I don't know, like, cause, because I don't think I've, Carol Rothman is the only Broadway producer I've worked with. And she is like, you know, she just started being a Broadway producer and she's really like, she's producing on Broadway as if it's nonprofit. So I don't think I've actually, um, come into contact with like the really hardcore, um, uh, uh, Broadway producing yet. Oh, I guess I have a little bit. I mean, I don't know. Like, I think I just don't have enough experience yet. Um, but, you know, in my experience, like, I don't know if you found this, but, um, you know, I think that there are great people at every level of theater who like get artists and that and and who um, are good to collaborate you know whether they're in um, commercial theater or in downtown theater and there are people who in downtown theater who are not um, great to collaborate with as producers so it's like you know I think um, I think it's definitely harder when everything's harder when there's actual money involved I mean that's the thing that I've discovered in life um, whenever people are doing what they're doing for really more for the love of it than you know to make money um, I found that that's just like a much easier and happier process. And it's like the more money that's involved and the more money that, that's at stake. Um, it's, you know, uh, um, it becomes, I think, I don't know, like, I think money kind of sucks magic out of things in some ways. Like even, even though money can also make the magic happen, it's just, um, yeah, I don't, I don't know. Like, I, I think I have like a lot of, um, I don't know if it's nostalgia or just a lot of affection for just people just making things for the love of it, you know, and not necessarily um, as a career or as a, as a profession. Um, you know, although I, at the same time, I totally think that artists should make money for what they do. So it's, yeah. It, it, Sorry, it is that was very rambling. It, it, no, no, no. But it, it's 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 great because it, it's sort of you're sort of talking about the tangle that we're all like part of, and it's it's really helpful to hear other people talk about it. How I love what you said about how money, maybe money sucks the magic out of everything, and how it's just hard to ne negotiate, and how there are different people, you know, diff they're good people at all levels, and there are assholes everywhere. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, it's um. It just, it all comes down to what the priority is, huh. you know? Uh -huh. And I think uh -huh. that any artistic project is blessed mm -hmm. and magical when the priority is making the work and people are on the same page about mm -hmm. what that is and, mm -hmm. um, and they want to make something great. I mean, I think mm -hmm. that if that's the priority, then it really doesn't matter what level you're at. Like mm -hmm. you're, it's going to be, you're going to make something interesting. Mm -hmm. And what are other priorities do you think that people might embrace? Like, I mean, it's, it's become such a piety where it's like you hear the word diversity and everybody's like, oh yes, of course, diversity, you know, but it's almost like become a meaningless word. Mm -hmm. Like you just say it in order to get people to not be mad at you or something, you know, like it's, but <laughs> you know, I truly, I absolutely am a deep believer in the power of diversity, mm -hmm. not as like a moral, you have to be inclusive, you can't leave people out, but more just like, I believe that um, diversity, cross-cultural collaboration, like all of that stuff, I think it's incredibly powerful mm -hmm. and interesting when people who, who come from different experiences um, come together and they have a shared vision for where they want to mm -hmm. go. Um, so I'm, I'm a big believer in diversity, for its own sake and mm -hmm. not as this kind of scolding, you know, moral principle. Like I, I really believe it's it's a good in and of itself. 
Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, and I think that ego, I mean, I, you know, I don't, I could be wrong, but in my experience, ego is the enemy of, of good mm -hmm. art. Um, I think, mm -hmm. uh, and I, you know, it, I, I'd love to be proved wrong, you know, where, mm -hmm. uh, you know, where there was something that was just driven, you know, something was just driven completely, you know, by someone's massive ego. And that was how it became amazing. I mean, I'd be very interested to see that. I've never seen it work that mm -hmm. way, especially not mm -hmm. in theater or in any kind of collaboration. Um, I think that it is possible to have a gigantic ego and to have ego not ruin what you're working on. You know, I think that happens quite a bit actually, where, where people come together and they all have massive egos and they just find a way to put them aside because the ego is not the priority. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Right, I love that. Yeah, the ego is not the problem, but it could, it could be. That's really great. That's great. So you're a musician also. Are you writing the, mu the music for your musical? Um, well, I, I don't know. Like, uh, so I, I would not call myself a musician. Um, I, uh, I co-wrote uh, the, the, the music for We're Gonna Die. Uh -huh. and, so um, and that was just kind of a random thing. It was, you know, it's just one of those great things that you do when you're pre-professional, mm -hmm. where you're mm -hmm. just like, yeah, I'll just try this and see how it goes. And, um, and so I, I co-wrote that with a co-composer and I might, I, I might do that again. I'm uh -huh. not, I'm not sure. Yeah. Uh -huh. But it's, it was fun. It was a, well, I mean, it was a great show. We're going to die, but, it, and it was great to see you, you performed. You were, you know, on stage. In the original yeah. production. In yes, the, oh, okay. That's, okay. <laughs> well, that's, that's the one I saw and I, I loved it, loved it. And so, so in the original production, others have gone on and, and done it all over the world. Um, but um, so you, it's, an, it's not gonna be the same team, the, the musicians, you know, you're gonna work with other musicians on this mu new musical. Um, you know, I don't know. It's still, it's still too early to say, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. um, uh, yeah, I'm not exactly sure what's gonna happen with this. I mean, it, it really is, it's been taking me forever to write it just because every version of it is mm -hmm. un, like, is not really producible mm -hmm. um, that, that I've written so far. So I'm just, you know, writing and rewriting to get to the, I mean, I'm scared to even show it to my agent right now. Uh -huh. um, and it's, at, it's at that level. So uh -huh. I just, I need to get it to the, I've been working on it forever and I just need mm -hmm. to get it to the place where I can show it to someone mm -hmm. and they're not going to freak out. Like that's basically my goal where I can show it to someone and they're not going to freak out. And, um, you know, because for me, I guess the one, uh, the one place I'm not willing to go uh -huh. is, I, the one thing I'm afraid of is, is doing something that makes it impossible for me to keep doing future work, right? Like oh, that's, oh. you know, that's, that's, um, oh. so I, uh, and I'm, you know, I'm probably overly worried about it, but, um, you know, like that is something like when I'm taking risks and when I'm mm -hmm. potentially making people angry, um, you know, there is sort of a thing in the back of my head that says, well, actually don't go so far that you won't be able to make work anymore mm -hmm. you know because mm -hmm. that would just I, I can't imagine a worse fate mm -hmm. so you we were talking the other day about our relationship with the police um and you know the police on the street but also the police in here um and the police in our community you know uh, or do you feel that there are police in our community art police art police y yeah um oh definitely yeah mm -hmm. i think about them all the time actually mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. the, the art mm -hmm. police and um you mm -hmm. know the people uh whose jobs it is you know or 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 not you know mm -hmm. like i think mm -hmm. um yeah the art police i sort of feel like oh man that's so that's such a tough one we could talk about it another t another t but it's just a, it's just uh you know because there's so many things that well, i mean we gather together here to encourage each other um, and the more we gather together and encourage each other, I'm aware of just that there are just things that are going on in our heads, whether it's art police or just our own baggage from our childhood or whatever that, that continues to, to encourage us not to. And what's great about having you here today is that you're such an, I mean, really, every time I see your work, I just feel like, yes, you know, go girl, go. Um, 
It's yeah. always the best night of the show is when you're there because the cast always freaks out and you're so <laughs> nice and you'll like leave a note and you're, you're like, <laughs> you're, you're just such a, you're just one of those people where um, oh, you bring joy kind. wherever you that's go. Well, um, as, as, as do you. As do you. Um, but you know what, actually I can what? say something about the art police. So okay. I, I teach playwriting uh -huh. at Stanford. Oh, and right okay. um, and uh, like the thing that I am just, um, so careful about, you know, pretty much every second that I'm teaching is not becoming the art police, right? Because that's a very art policey type of job, um, uh, mm -hmm. you know, to, to, to be a professor of playwriting and to mm -hmm. have students. And so I basically have structured all of my classes and everything that I do um, uh, to, to prevent that dynamic Mm -hmm. where I'm the authority figure mm -hmm. and my taste and like what I, you know, um, what I, um, what I think is right mm -hmm. somehow gets into the students' mm -hmm. psyche, right. you know? And, right. and, and so like my process is very much about, like when you said that you're, you're doing this just as sort of like, as, as sort of like an encouragement, this community mm -hmm. Encouragement. Mm -hmm. um, I would say that that's probably like at the core of my playwriting teaching is just right. basically figuring out how to do this, right. how to create a community of people who support each other and, you know, where the professor is a member of that community right. and not this art police gatekeeper right, 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 right. Who, who's right. determining your fate. Right. But at the same time, I'll, I'll just say something and we'll take the questions from the, but at the same time, I, I mean, I feel like, I mean, I don't know if you feel like, I feel like I do have some kind of um, obligation as one of the guardians of the galaxy to say, hey, brother, hey, sister, hey, friend, that, that is uncool. But you're, what you're putting on the page is uncool. I'm just going to yeah. say it. You can put it on the page if you want. It's your play. It's your novel, whatever. But I'm just going to say, and that, you know, so that, I don't think that's policing. I think that's something that comrades in the field do for each other. No, um, that's, that's helping. I think, right, I think that's right, helping, you know, right, the kind of police right. I'm, policing I'm talking about is like, this is good playwriting and not bad playwriting. Um, you know, and, and there's a big difference between that and saying, Hey, you know, you're doing something in this play that I, I you know, I don't know that that's what you, that's what you want to be doing. I mean, my nightmare, I, I have this nightmare scenario where a student comes into my class and says like, my goal is to write the most successful piece of white supremacist propaganda ever, you know, and sort yeah. of like dealing with that situation. Like yeah. I, I kind of have like a, a nightmare about that. Like when, when that's the intent. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and fortunately I've never had that and knock on wood, I, you know, that won't happen to me. But um, aside from that, like, I think, you know, I've never had a student where that was their goal to hurt people with their art. And so when you point out that they're doing it, you know, um, that's, uh, I, I think that that is, um, uh, that, that's, a, that's a helpful thing to do. Right on, right on. Okay, so Audrey's gonna help us uh, yeah. do the questions and I'll just put myself on mute. All right, amazing. All right, up first, we've got Elena. Elena, are you with us? Yes, I'm here. I, I just want to thank you so much, uh, Yang Jane Lee, for joining us today. You're one of my favorite playwrights, and We're Gonna Die is one of my favorite pieces. Um, I have a question for you about younger playwrights that are starting off that are writing pieces that aren't traditionally like long, well-made plays um, with, you know, like the three unities and whatnot and that are trying to submit their work to theaters, but that's not the type of, kind of like what you were talking about like with money earlier, that's not the type of like work that theaters want to produce and they want to accept because it's a risk and they don't wanna take a risk, risk on young playwrights. So if you have any advice concerning that. Well, I, you know, that, that I get asked that question all the time. And so I've been sort of looking into it and asking people, like I ask people on Twitter, like how, how did you get produced? And it turns out that there are, um, uh, there are, let's see, I mean, there's a, there's a number of ways. I think it is very, very difficult. Um, I think right now the system is set up in kind of an unfair way where, you know, people who go to these really expensive MFA programs um, are often, you know, there's this, 
kind of um, pipeline of privilege where you know you go through this very expensive process and then you um, and then the, the doors sort of open for you and and you know and that's obviously one way people who um, who, who can't go in that direction or don't want to go that route um, uh, you know when I asked on Twitter people said that um, uh, competitions you know, like and basically anything that you can enter um, that is a competition or a development series or whatever. Like I've had, there were people who had applied for a grant and they didn't get the grant, but then there was a panelist on the the grant panel who was the artistic director of a theater and then they were interested and they reached out. Um, I've had, there are people who, there are playwrights who have had readings and, um, that led to that actually led to production. It went through development and led through production. I had always thought that was kind of an urban myth, but apparently it does happen where you manage to bust through the development process and actually get produced. Um, there was another story about someone who just started chatting with an artistic director at some event and the artistic director got interested in their work, asked to see the script and ended up producing it. So, you know, I think, I think that, um, you know, the sense that I get is and I, I talked to artistic directors at theaters about blind submissions and everybody was basically like, we don't do that. Like almost no theaters except blind submissions or read them or anything like they usually work with um, agents, you know, whom you get a lot of the time through being through the, you know, going through the pipeline of, of privilege. But, you know, it's, it's, there are, I think one thing that people don't realize is you know, so I was in Chicago and I invited a bunch of Chicago theaters um, to, to smaller Chicago theaters to come um, to see my show that I was doing. And they and they wrote me back the nicest email and they said, you know, oh, like, you know, we, we really, you know, love you and we respect your work, but we, we can't go to a white supremacist theater. And 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 I and I remember thinking like, oh, well, but you know, I wrote back and I was like, oh, you know, I'm sorry, I'm a little confused. The only artists in this theater right now are all people of color. And they said, yes, but the theater is still created by white people for white people, largely, you know, attended by white people and no offense, but they only produce artists like you who, who have been sanctioned by the white supremacist pipeline, pipeline of privilege. And they basically said this to me and they described the work that they were doing. And it just sounded amazing. Like they relied on no outside funding, all the funding they got came from within their own communities. They were making work for their communities and um, doing great, you know, like butts in seats, like a lot of enthusiasm. So, I mean, that what that taught me is that there are there's so much theater going on in this country and so many different models and ways of doing it. And, um, you know, I think that, uh, you know, if you look at the actual list of theaters in this country, it's like we, you know, when I, when my students talk, like they only name like the same five theaters over and over again, you know, but those theaters program actually very little. And there's like, you know, so many theaters, you know, hopefully they will stay, you know, they will be able to keep going, you know, and survive this crisis. But, um, you know, people are out there getting produced, um, getting discovered. And, um, you know, um, the Dramatist Guild, actually, I, you know, one of the best things you can do is join the Dramatist Guild because they have like a, they have so many resources. They have um, uh, a handbook that tells you tons and tons of things you can, um, a guidebook of all these things that you can apply to. Um, and then you can access it, the e-version e free online if you, um, uh, if you, if you uh, are, are a member and they have like discount memberships for students and it's like, yeah, that, that's, uh, that's a really great resource. Yeah, I love the Dramatist Guild. Thank you so much. Um, we're gonna go to Natalia next. Natalia, are you there? Yes, hi. Hi, hi. Um, so thank you so much for, for um, taking your time here and sharing your thoughts with um, theater and privilege. And honestly, um, I am a playwright that just started to call themselves a playwright. Um, and it's scary, especially now, just because I have so much pent up story in me that I want to just pour out. Um, and so far I've been doing a lot of the word vomiting, um, as I've mentioned, maybe a few weeks ago at the SLP and, um, it's been helping because I now know when my creative flow comes out, um, which is around midnight 
when I'm trying to go to bed. <laughs> um, and I've been trying to connect with my history and uh, with family and um, trying to try to produce work and write work that is um, authentically, I guess in terms of like uh, the culture that I was born in. Um, my mom is from Guatemala and my dad's from uh, Cuba. So I'm trying to incorporate a story that blends two stories um, and how I'm in this in between of a Latina, but also an American um, and can also come off as white passing and trying to check myself uh, when it comes to privilege and uh, sharing these stories. So um, my question would be like, how do you navigate that space in, um, you know, not like I, I'm trying not to like bark out my story, you know, I, I, like I want to roll it out and um, I wanna get feedback, honest feedback um, when it comes to writing my story. Um, how to get honest feedback on yeah, your how, how to get, yeah, how to get honest feedback um, because I feel like a lot of people are, they get uncomfortable uh, when it comes to truth and when it comes to just reading something that's just not the most positive um, or at least in their mindset, not the most positive, but it's what I'm like, it's my norm. Um, so like, how, how do I navigate that, that space of honest feedback when it comes to writing? Um, you know, this is this is a great question, and it it comes up every time I make a new show, um, because you know you need your collaborators to be honest with you. Like the the worst thing for a show is to be surrounded by yes people who don't say what they really think. You know, um, because that's how bad things stay bad. And you know, Susan Laurie's thing about like pointing out this is messed up, that's messed up. You need those people around, or you're you're dead, right? Because it's like some you know someone's gonna do it. You know, if your team doesn't do it, someone else is gonna do it and you'll be in trouble. So what I do is when I, you know, the first time I'm sort of talking to everyone, whether it's a team I put together for a show or whether it's just, um, a, a, you know, a one-time audience for a reading or what have you, um, I just say, uh, like I speak in a very honest way about, um, from the outset about my, fears about the project, my insecurities, the bumps we've encountered along the way. And, um, and, and I sort of model what I want them to do for me, you know, so, so, you know, I'm very honest and I share things that, um, you know, are a little bit scary to share. And then I just ask them, you know, like I, I, I you know, I, I, it would be so great. Um, you know, it's not helpful to me. Uh, unless you tell me honestly, like what you really think and you're here to help and I would just be so appreciative of it. And then, you know, if anyone gives a criticism, you, you really react with gratitude so that everyone else can see like, oh, okay, this isn't gonna be a dangerous situation because a lot of people don't really wanna hear criticism. And when you're honest with them, it will make them not like you, you know, yeah. which I think is so unfair. I think that's so unfair to ask for criticism and then dislike the person who gives it to you. But if you're just sending clear vibes of like, I'm being super transparent about this, I really want to hear your thoughts. And then you back that up by not getting mad <laughs> about the things that people say, you know, which may yeah. or may not be helpful. You know, like, I think that's, uh, I've, I've, that, that has always worked for me. Right. Well, thank you so much. I appreciate it. Sure. And good luck. Thank Thanks, you. Thanks, Natalia. Um, all right, we've got a little less than 10 minutes left um, and we're gonna go to Maggie. Hey, Maggie. Hey, um, this is crazy. Uh, Y'all are two of my favorite playwrights of all time. I'm like a little nervous sitting here in my bedroom. Um, <laughs> uh, my question is super specific. I'm working on a play right now that has a ton of stage directions. It's sort of weird like sci-fi type kind of thingy um and I'm getting I find myself like getting super bogged down in the stage directions and like wondering about consistency of language and just things like do I always refer to it as her chair or is it going to be the chair does it even matter I'm like looking at the, the, the thesaurus all the time and I'm kind of like I don't know, um, when you're dealing with a lot of stage directions in a piece, like what the hell do you do? 
<laughs> um, so I, I just, I just, um, I have a script that's about to come out. That's just all stage directions. It's a show called Untitled Feminist Show. There's no dialogue. It's all stage directions. It was a total nightmare. So I know exactly what you're talking about. It was a total nightmare. Um, stage directions are a nightmare. Um, I would say, don't worry about that stuff until it's time to publish it. Right, like just make sure that the stage directions are clear enough for you know your director, your actor. You know, it's just um, all of that nitpicking. That's you. You generally don't have to worry about most of that stuff until it's time to publish, um, and then you know, then you know you'll be in for it. But at that point, you'll have less to worry about, and all you'll have to worry about is just you know the the, the wording and consistency and all of that stuff. So I think that. Um, you know, depending on where you are in the process. Like uh, I always tell, you know, my students that if your brain is a dial, um, you, you know, my students will, they'll have the dial at 10 when they're starting. And I'm just like, that is never gonna work. Like that is never gonna work. Like start at a one or at like a point two, you know, start at a point two and you don't go to 10 until it's the final rehearsal before opening and you just want to get those final little details right. Like that's when the 10 is really useful, but the 10, you know, and it sounds like right now you're at a 10 with the stage directions, um, uh, you know, too early. So just think of it as the dial and just keep the dial, you know, where, where it should be um, in your process. That's so helpful. Thank you so much. Sure. Thanks, Maggie. Um, all right, up next, we've got Kate. Go for it, Kate. Hi, yes, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes. Yep. Okay, this is uncanny because I wanted to ask you about Untitled Feminist Show. <laughs> when you were writing, it's one of my favorite works of all time. When you were writing, were you imagining the movement? And if you could just talk about your writing process in terms of seeing and writing, if you know what I mean. Yeah, well, I did not write that in advance. Like that was that was made collaboratively with my team and with my cast members. And then the script is more of like a documentation of what happened. And it's also a documentation of the, the um, you know, what I was trying to do throughout uh, with the collaborators. But that process was very much like coming into rehearsal and saying, hey, I want a scene that does this. How do we make that happen? And then we all tried to figure out a way to make that happen with bodies on stage. It was it was a very um, different way of working for me. And, you know, yeah, I've never done that since. <laughs> awesome. Thanks, Kate. Um, all right, we've got Giselle. Go for it, Giselle. Hey, um, hi, I'm Jean Lee. Hi, SLP. I love you both so much. So it's an honor to be here with you. Um, I actually assistant directed uh, Straight White Men at Marin Theater Company, and it was a blast. I had so much fun. Thank you for oh. writing that. <laughs> um, so I'm a director, and while in I've always been a writer, but like a closet writer. And um, during quarantine, I've it suddenly dawned on me like, I think I want to step into my writing personhood, <laughs> um, but it's scary and it's just a completely, not completely new because I'm a storyteller, but it's a very new path. And I know that, um, you know, just reading your biography um, that like you fell into playwriting kind of abruptly. Um, at least that's how I read it. Um, but I was just wondering if you could offer any advice to those of us here who feel like playwriting is something we want to do, but it's very new. Um, and just how do we get onto that path? You know, I actually have a recorded Zoom workshop that I made at the beginning of the of the of the lockdown. And it's like a workshop that basically takes a total beginner or or a more experienced person through the beginning stages of writing a new play. So um, it's it's on Vimeo. I'm just wondering how you would find it. Um, it's on my Twitter page if you scroll down, but uh, you might be able to just Google it. I don't know. Let me, um, uh, yeah, just if you go to my Twitter page, like you'll, you'll be able to see it, but it's, it's um, people have been writing plays just using, using that um, workshop as a guideline. It's basically designed, I, I designed it exactly for somebody in your position. So I would, I would check that out. You might find that helpful to just go through that workshop. Well, thank you. Thank you. Um, if you want to send it to me, I can tweet it to the Watch Your Work. Oh yeah, that would be great. Yeah, I'll send it to you. Thank awesome. you. Of course. 
All right, we've got about three minutes left and we're gonna go to Greg. Oh, thank you. Um, so maybe more than a three minute question, I don't know. But I love what you were talking about at the very beginning that you worked on this piece that you were terrified to work on. And um, so I'm working on a piece that I don't want anyone to know what it is or what I'm writing about. And I've gotten some critiques from people that are quite appropriate and right, you know? And so it's like the, the, these police that we've been talking about, you know? Um, when like my own inner playwriting police kind of get together with the playwriting police out there and there's some really accurate and precise and good contributions that they're making, how do you incorporate that in your process? Like I put that voice right into my play and I'm finding it really helpful and successful in that way, but I'm also really interested in hearing what other people do. And oh, and by the way, thank you both so much. It's been really exciting. Yeah, no, that's exactly what I do. I put yeah. I put the voice in my play. It just becomes a part of, so rather than becoming like an obstacle or a problem in what I'm trying to do, it just expands it, right? So it's like, I was here and now I'm here. So that is, um, uh, I find that that's always uh, a positive thing. The one thing that I'm careful about though is sometimes there will be like an outlier, someone who has an opinion that nobody else agrees with. And, um, uh, and I've never known it to be the case that that one outliner, if you consult a large enough group of people um, uh, up who, who have the, the appropriate knowledge for what you're doing, I've never known it to be the case that the one person was actually, you know, usually it's just a very personal idiosyncratic thing. So I've known people to get really screwed up by by listening too much to one person who doesn't agree with it. you know so say you get you ask a large group of korean americans do you think this thing is offensive you ask 10 people one person says yes it's offensive everybody else says no it's not offensive it doesn't mean it's not offensive it just you know it it, it just means that there's um there's disagreement and one person's an outlier and it's something to take into consideration but i don't my rule is never like no person can ever be offended or object to anything ever because then it, I mean that's impossible. There's no way to do it. Oh, that's so helpful. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you, thank you. It's six o'clock. <laughs> that's amazing. Hey, Lori, so thank you so much for having me. Thank this you. Amazing. Yeah, I feel like I came into your magical world and like soaked up all the magic from everyone. It was like amazing. And you gave so much magic too. You're welcome back anytime you want to stop by, girl. You come, you stop by and, and hang out and, and do things like you did today. I think people really get a lot out of hearing you talk about your process and help them with their work and we really, really appreciate you. Such a blessing and inspiration. Oh. Best of luck on your musical. Yay. It's so great what you're Can't doing. Wait. Can't yeah. wait. We love you. We love you. We'll be back tomorrow, everybody. We'll be so, back tomorrow. Okay, we'll be back tomorrow. And uh, Audrey will tell you what to do. Sign up. And we'll yes, yeah, <laughs> sign up by 3 p.m. Eastern every single day. And I'll send you a link between 3 p.m. and 4.30 p.m. Eastern time. See you okay. tomorrow. Okay. Love great. to Young J.